All right. Hello, Pathfinders. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to another week of e-honors with the BOC. Today, I'm going to present to you one of the first two honors, and it's on uh, a microscopic life. By the way, my name is Selvin, um, I, and I am present, presenting to you from Dublin and a part of the Irish machine. So, um, how many of you have used a microscope in school? Anybody? You should be able to type in the chat and just say yes. Yeah. Yep, Shelley said she has. Okay, I see a few responses there. Okay, if you haven't, and I think this is the right place you are in, we're gonna learn about the microscope and you're gonna see some exciting uh, things that you would come across of microorganisms that you are there around our lives. Okay, Bogdan, we'll go to the next slide. So today we're going to learn about uh, a microscope, its parts and its uses. And then as I have said it earlier, we're going to learn about the microscopic life. We're going to use, learn about some of the usefulness of some of the microscopic lives. And of course, today we're gonna to learn a microscopic life honor. And if you do this honor, the microscopic life, you'll be able to do a second honor that's called the blood and bodies defenses. So I hope I'll be able to present that sometime uh, when we get an opportunity. And in doing so, you could do and earn a health master's award. Now health master's award, you need to earn seven different uh, honors. So if you do a microscopic life, if you do uh, blood defenses, there you go, have two already, and you can do five more and earn the Health Masters Award. Somebody, um, self and somebody said on um, Zoom that they are saving up to buy a microscope as well. So that's amazing. Wow. wow. Well, yeah, some microscopes come cheap, okay? As cheap as 30 euros. And some microscopes are really expensive some as high as $15,000. Okay, the one that we use in the hospitals are very expensive for diagnostic purposes. All right, you can see them in really good magnification. So let's uh, go straight into a microscope. Let's see what are the different parts. All right, so before we go to the microscope, I have a question for you. Do you know that we could diagnose different kinds of diseases just looking under a microscope? Have you ever thought about it? Just looking down a microscope, you'd be able to say what kind of disease a person has. Anybody who can, uh, has any experience, even the counselors or the bigger pathfinders, some of the things that you can diagnose using by just looking down a microscope. Jeremiah, you're saying no again. Okay, so anybody else? Yes, Lorota. Can you, can you say what it is? Yeah, somebody said cancers. Oh, lovely. That's exactly the field I am in. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to you about a few diseases that, that we come across every day. And then what are those caused by? For example, food poisoning. You ever heard about food poisoning? This is a common occurrence. If you're not careful with what you eat and if you don't wash your hands properly. Food poisoning can be caused by little bacteria called Salmonella, Shigella, and also by E. coli. Okay, um, common cold, anybody? This is the season for cold, okay? It's caused by the influenza virus. And this virus can also be seen under the microscope. Malaria, have you heard about malaria? Malaria is caused by a plasmodium uh, species. Okay, it causes high temperatures and if not treated, it can be deadly as well. What about filaria? 
You've heard about elephantiasis, hookworms. They're all called, caused by nematodes, okay, blood nematodes. And also, one common thing that we come across every day in my diagnostic experience is iron deficiency anemia, okay? What you typically see in a blood film, okay, when you take a blood sample from a patient, make a blood smear and observe under the microscope, what you would see are changes in red cells. So you would come across hyperchromic microcytes and pencil cells. Somebody did mention about blood cancer. Now, to identify blood cancer, there are hundreds of different cancers, leukemias, chronic leukemias and acute leukemias. But in blood cancer, if you come across a cell called a blast cell, okay, that is the most immature blood cell, then it, say, it shows that somebody's got a cancer, okay? And what about bleeding disorders? Okay, have you heard about anyone who's got a bleeding disorder? If you get a cut, you bleed profusely and it doesn't stop. Or somebody, if you've seen somebody with a nosebleed, okay? These are some blood disorders where there is some defect in the platelets. Sometimes the number of platelets are low. So when they are low, you know, platelets are necessary for blood clotting. So when they are low, when you observe, you can observe under the microscope if the patient is thrombocytopenic or if the patient has adequate platelets. Okay, and the other thing is COVID-19. We are in the year of the pandemic. So you would have heard a number of times COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. It's caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2. So all these can be observed under a microscope. Now, you would have come across microscopes in schools. Now, these are, those are simple microscopes. They have an eyepiece, body, arm, and a base, okay? But the, some of the microscopes that are used for diagnostic purposes are really powerful ones that you can be able to see. Okay, let's go to the types of microscope. Okay. Oh, just oh, before yeah. we move on, Selvin, sorry, I just had a few that came through from Facebook. Um, yeah. They just said bacteria, malaria, uh, Shaka's disease. Yes. Shaka's disease yeah. um, and African sleeping sickness. That's right. Yeah. South American. All of those. Shaka's, yeah. Caused by Trypanosoma cruzae. Okay. And nice. say yes. Say yes when you want me to change the slide, please. Okay, so what are the different types of microscopes? Okay, um, one, compound microscope. The one that you see on the right-hand side, it's a compound microscope, or the simple microscopes that you see in the labs are all compound microscopes. The one on the left you see, uh, number two, is an electron microscope. Now, electron microscopes are very expensive microscopes. These go into minute details of a molecule. So they are expensive, and they're mainly used for uh, research purposes. And the one that you use regularly are the compound microscopes. Okay, uh, moving on to the third type of microscope. Okay, if you haven't already got your worksheets, I think they are on the website. Um, you can use your worksheets to write it down or you can take notes. Okay, here you need to identify four types of different microscopes. So one we covered as a compound microscope, a second an electron microscope, third is a dark field microscope. Now what we, the dark field microscope uses uh, an optical illumination technique that contrasts the unstained uh, samples. So unlike the compound microscope where you use stained films, here it is unstained, okay? It's simply that the light that passes through the medium kind of eliminates the subject, okay? And it produces classic appearance of dark, almost black uh, background with bright objects in it, okay? Uh, the other type of microscope is the fluorescence microscope, okay? In fluorescence microscope, what you're trying to do is trying to fluoresce the, the subject, okay, uh, in a slide um, instead of reflection or absorption. So in a light microscope like uh, compound or even electron microscope, they use light. But here in a fluorescence microscope, you're trying to use some stains. Either they are fluorescence or phosphor, phosphorescence uh, fluoro fluorochromes. Sorry, it's a bit tongue twisting. Okay, and this microscope is used for study of properties of organic or inorganic substances. Okay, um, are you able to follow? Tell me if I'm too fast, I'll slow down a little bit. 
Next slide, please. Okay, yeah, I just touched a little bit on uh, fluorescence and phosphorescence. Okay, it's a type of photoluminescence. Uh, now, this is typically like a glow in the dark. You, you ought to come across um, hands of a watch that glow in the dark. So that, they use the technique of phosphorescence. All right, number nine, please. Okay, the fifth type of microscope uses a technique called the phase contrast microscopy. Now this is a contrast enhancing optical technique and it produces really high contrast images of transparent specimens. Here, the living cells are not stained, but they produce a contrast, okay? They are used to study living cells, microorganisms, thin tissue slices and subcellular particles, including nuclei, nuclei and their organelles. Okay, um, at this point, I would like to share with you a short video that I made at work. And my colleague, Natalie Maloney, has kindly um, obliged to, um, to be the subject who has gone through the different parts of a microscope. So for you to have a visual look. Okay, just before the video starts, it may be a little bit quiet, so you may need to just bump up your sound just before it plays. Okay, yeah. I'm a medical scientist here in St. James Hospital and I'm a colleague of Salvin Nakas and today we're just going to show you the main parts of the compound microscope that we use every day to review blood films. Um, we look at blood films to make sure that the blood cells are normal and if they're not we need to investigate further. They could be abnormal for numerous reasons and they can be linked to a number of different diseases so it's very important that we notice what's abnormal. So to begin with, I'll show you the power switch. The power switch is over here to the side and we'll turn that on. Broadly speaking, the microscope can be divided into three pieces, the headpiece, the body and the base. So at the top here, we can look at the eyepiece. This is where we look down into the microscope. As so, we can adjust this to fit our own eyes. I suppose everyone has different shaped faces, so we can adjust this as we need to. So this is where we look down, and this is our eyepiece. This here is the nose piece, and it holds the objective lenses. We have a number of obje objective lenses of different magnifications. The weak ones, by 10, by 20, and the higher magnifications are the strong magnifications of by 40, by 60, and by 100. Um, the lower magnifications give us a broad feel for the film, um, not much detail, but the higher magnifications allows us to examine the blood cells under a higher magnification and we can see the specifics and the details of the different cell types. Here is the stage. The stage is what holds the film. So if we place the blood film down, the stage holds it. As so, this here is the clip that holds the film into place. At the side here, we have the coarse focus and the fine focus wheels. The coarse focus allows us to move the stage up and down. And this will sort of give a broad speaking sort of magnification. It's not very specific, but or detailed nearly. The fine focus finely tunes in the details. So it's a broad and a fine sort of focus wheel that helps us um, tune into the cell types. So at the bottom here we have the diaphragm. Here we have a light source. We can adjust the light source to very bright to very low. And we can open and close the diaphragm to adjust the light source as well. 
So those are the main pieces of a microscope and I suppose a microscope is an essential tool for us scientists in the hospital. We use it every day and it's important that we look after our microscopes and make sure that they're functioning properly so we can see the blood films and we can pick up any bad results and help the patients. Thank you. Okay, so we've been through a short video about the different parts of the microscope. Now we're going to calculate um, the magnification of a microscope. All right, right at the top of a microscope is the eye lens. Okay, now it's got a magnification power of. Uh, can you back go back to the old uh, slide, please? So, oh, sorry, yeah, I could go to the next one. Thanks. So the eye lens has a lens that has a value of 10x, okay? And then as seen in the video, there are different types of objective lenses. There could be 10, 20, 40, and in some places 60 and 100. Both 60x and 100x are really the, the highest resolution, or the high power, and they use oil immersion. Right, to, so to calculate the magnification, so the eye lens has 10 and the objective has 10. So to, to calculate the total magnification, you're gonna multiply 10 times 10. So the ocular is 10 and the objective lens is 10. So the total magnification is 100, okay? So if you're using an objective lens with a 40X, what do you think is the total magnification, anybody? If you're using looking down a microscope, the lens has 10 on it. Okay, it's always standard 10, the ocular lens. Okay, and then the objective lens, you're using a 40. I, I see a, I've seen a right answer there. Okay, Cheryl said 400. That's right. So when you multiply 10 and 40, you get 400. Okay, that's the total magnification. What do you mean by total magnification? Okay, if you look under the microscope, the object that you're seeing is magnified 400 times. Do you get me? So it is so mi microscopic. So the object that you're seeing is literally 400 times bigger and you're able to see properly. Okay. Uh, yes, Bogdan, next one, please. Okay. Yeah, keep moving. We've been through all this explained in the video. Next, please. Next one, please. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so as I said, to calculate the magnification, it's ocular versus uh, times objective lens. Next one, please. Okay. So what if you're using, okay, you already seen that. Okay. If you're using a 100x oil immersion lens, what is your total magnification now? Anybody? You can type in your answers. The question is, again, if you're using a 100x objective, what is the total magnification of the subject? Mind you, the ocular lens is 10x or 10, and the objective lens is 100. Yeah, I see some right answers there. So the correct answer is 1,000. So you're literally seeing the object magnified a thousand times. Thank you for your, for your right answers, people, for putting on your chat and Facebook and also on the Zoom platform. All right, so moving on. We're gonna learn a few of the microscopic terms that you would come across uh, in this honor. Okay, so the slide, what is a slide? Now slide is something that you place it on the stage. Okay, now, the slide contains a cow slip. Okay, um, it could be a wet mount or it could be a dry film. When I say a wet mount, you are looking at, say for example, a water droplet. So you have a slide and you place your water drop and you place a cover slip. A cow slip is a thin glass slip that is used to cover the, your 
your object there. Now, this makes it easy for the light to pass through and you're able to see under the microscope, okay? Uh, it is used to cover the specimen and it is sandwiched between the slide and the cover slip. Okay, so the wet mount, you're able to see live organisms because sometimes they, they might be moving. It could be a bacteria or it could be a hydra or it can, could even be, uh, yeah, wet mount is anything in a liquid, that's right. Uh, it could be uh, a, a hydra, bacteria, uh, even, sometimes you'll even see an arthropods in it, okay? Um, the next uh, term is, next slide please. Right. Sometimes you, you need a, a fixative, okay? Now fixing, what it does is preserves a specimen and it does not uh, prevent from decomposing. Once the specimen has been fixed, it can be stored away and looked at it again. So like, for example, what we do in the hematology or the main lab, the place that I work is a blood film is made, a drop of blood, made a smear, it's fixed. It's fixed with methanol. Methanol helps to preserve the blood cells, okay? And then once it's stained, um, it can be easily looked at, okay? Now, I already mentioned staining. Now, staining helps to clearly identify. As you know, in a cell, for example, there's a cytoplasm, it's got a nucleus as well, okay? The cytoplasm is basic in nature and attracts the acid dye. The nucleus is acidic in nature and it attracts the the, the basic part of the stain, okay? So I'm sorry, I'm uh, going a bit uh, technical, sometimes uh, a bit scientific. It's because this is a scientific honor. So if you're unable to follow, um, please put on your questions. I'll be able to answer your questions maybe after the presentation. Um, um, okay, so yeah, uh, sometimes, yeah, you use stains to stain so that you'll be able to see the cells or the subject clearly under the microscope. Uh, the next term is the oil immersion. Oil immersion, as I told you earlier, we use the 60x objective lens or the 100x objective lens. Now this helps, now there's, one, once you use the low power objective, either the 10, 20, or 40, there is a distance between the slide and the objective lens, okay? If you're using an oil lens, so there is no gap between the lens and the subject. So there is oil underneath that, okay? So this kind of a prevents from any diffraction of light, okay? The light that passes from the subject goes straight into your eyepiece and you're able to see that. So there is no distortion of any image. That's the use of an oil immersion. Next, please. All right, so using a microscope, what can we see? So some of the things that we can see are unicellular organisms. The very mention of the term unicellular, you should be able to know that they are single cell organisms, okay? They include bacteria, proteus, and yeast, okay? Um, examples like paramecium. I, I wonder if you ever come across a paramecium. It is a slipper shaped, um, yeah. Um, you know the slippers, the common slippers that we wear. They are slipper shaped, they are unicellular and found in pond waters. This is come off one of the common things that you would see uh, in a pond water. Next place, number five, is an activity. Okay, uh, before we go on to that, uh, multicellular. There are still a few more terms that need, to be, that need to be gone through. Okay, so multicellular. The term multicellular simply means that the organism is made up of multiple cells, of more than one cell. And it's composed of a group of cells that differentiate into specialized functions. For example, in the human body, there are nerve cells, there are skin cells, there are muscle cells, blood cells, and different other types of blood cells. Okay, you will learn about all this in your school as well, in your science subject. Next, please. Okay, so you would come across organisms with, um, uh, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Cilia. Okay, now cilia are hair-like appendages that are found around a cell, uh, which allow the cell to propel itself in water, just like how we have hands and legs to move about, the animals and humans. These, these organisms have cilia that which help them move about 
in search of food and water. What about flagella? Now, flagella is a whip-like structure at the end of a cell that allows it to swim through the water. Okay, now an organism can have cilia and flagella, all these a combination of things. What about plankton? Now, plankton are any type of unicellular marine organisms at the bottom of the food chain. Okay, this is what bacteria feeds on or algae feeds on. Okay, so for the requirement number five, we have an activity. Um, this activity actually involves <clears throat> us to actually do some work to go out, get some samples of water. Uh, it could be from a ditch or from nearby stream or ponds or, or from a puddle, okay? Uh, but unfortunately, all of us are so isolated and so far apart. Uh, with, this is a teaching honor. But I think this is a good activity for you to do it once you maybe go back to your Pathfinder clubs. Um, if you have an access to a microscope, you could do is, what you could do is collect water samples, put a drop of that on a slide, cover slip it with a cover slip and observe under the microscope. What do you think you, you could possibly see under that in a wet preparation like that? Anybody? All right, so once you take this dirty water or even a water from a stream or a puddle, please repeat the question. The question is, what are some of the common things that you would see in a wet preparation? Something that you made, uh, you've taken a water droplet from a puddle or a stagnant water and put it under, on the slide and observe under a microscope. What do you expect to see? Do you see any worms? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. If the water is terribly bad, yeah, you can see some worms. What I would expect to see are some algae, some hydra, unicellular organisms like protozoa, bacteria, and some arthropods. Yeah, you would see loads of bacteria. And mind you, if you take the sample of water and culture them, okay, what is a culture? It is a growth medium. If you take a sample of that water and streak it on a plate, it could be an agar plate, it could be a McConkie agar, it could be a chocolate agar, it could be a blood agar plate. There are different types of uh, mediums. So if you streak them on the plate and incubate them at 37 degrees centigrade, okay, this little drop of water that you put it on the plate would grow many different types of organisms. I'd expect to see fungi, I would expect to see algae, yeah. There's so many things that you can, uh, that grows in that little bit of water, okay? So it just goes to show that there's life around everywhere. And if you give them the right um, conditions and they would grow. And these are the things that you could observe under the microscope. Okay, that's our little activity. I hope uh, you could take this activity to your counselors in your different clubs and see if you can complete this activity for you to uh, accomplish this honor. Right, so let's get back to the basic, okay? Uh, you are observing a cell. So the basic parts of a cell, as you know, the outer shell is the uh, cell membrane, okay? Within the cell membrane is the cytoplasm, okay? And the cytoplasm, within the cytoplasm is your nucleus. Of course, the nucleus has um, a nucleoli. Um, if you go further in detail, okay, um, can you go to the next slide, please? You would see Golgi apparatus, centrosomes, ribosomes, rough endoplasmic retic uh, reticulum, and so many things. This is a bit complex. I wouldn't expect, excuse me, I wouldn't expect you to learn all these things, but what I would like to, you to take away from here is that in a cell, there is a cell wall or a cell membrane, which houses the cytoplasm, and within the cytoplasm is your nucleus. Now, every plant cell or an animal cell has a nucleus, has a cytoplasm, has a cell membrane, okay? But there's one difference between a plant cell and, and an animal cell. Can anybody say what it is? Name one part that is found in a plant cell that is not present in an animal cell. Rakhil, cell wall, no, they are present in both. Thanks for your answers.
Any more answers out there? Just waiting for Facebook to catch up. Okay. Um, what is one difference between a plant cell and an animal cell? They're very similar, but there's one thing that is different from them. Mind you, the, both of them have a, uh, a cell membrane, cytoplasm, nucleus. These are the main structures. Did I miss an answer? Shape? Thanks. Somebody's <laughs> put Golgi vessels, uh, chlorophyll. All right, yeah. There is a chlorophyll that's not in an animal cell. Yeah, chloroplast is, chloroplast is very typical uh, to a plant cell. Yeah, I take that as an answer. There's another thing that's in my mind. Yeah, this I see a cell wall there. I see a vacuole. Okay, I think, yeah, who's this? Uh, let me see, I'm seeing it on Facebook here. Lutunda Pulomo, Pulomo. sorry if I mispronounce your name. Um, it is a vacuole. Oh, sorry, it's Yan Jun Chan. Apologies, yeah, a vacuole, that's right. Sol, Sophia, and Wendy, you got it right as well. Thanks for all your answers, you're brilliant kids. Okay, thanks for paying attention. Um, we'll move on to our next slide, please. Okay, now we're gonna learn, having learned about a simple structure of a cell wall, uh, sorry, a cell. We're just gonna move on a little bit more. Um, the kingdoms of uh, the microscopic life. Now there are different types of, uh, uh, and there are six classic kingdoms that each organism that falls under. Okay, and of these kingdoms, these six kingdoms were described by Linnaeus, okay, for classification. Initially, they only differentiated as plants and animals, but then there are more than plants and animals. So that kind of system no longer works, okay. Today's system's classification includes six different kingdoms, okay. Of them are plants, animals, protists, fungi, archaebacteria, and eubacteria, okay. They are classified based on their cell type, how complex they are and how simple they are, and their ability to make food and the number of cells present in their body. Next, please. Now, these are broad divisions, okay? I'm not just talking about microscopic life, okay? Now, plants, okay? These are big structures. Plants are everywhere. As you know, there are about 250,000 different species in the plant kingdom. Um, they range from tiny green mosses to giant trees, okay? They come from a little spore, a small little spore, and they can grow into a big tree as well, okay? Um, and many plants are multicellular, and they consist of complex cells. And without plants, life on Earth would not exist. Anybody out there can tell me what are the uses of plants? Don't tell, I mean, there's so many things. One basic thing without that we, we can't live yeah there's so many things food medicines to eat yeah what goes into the plants and what comes out of the plants that's what i'm expecting oxygen that's right oxygen i see a lot of oxygen that's right yeah so fresh air comes from oxygen they take in all the carbon dioxide because plants need uh, carbon dioxide um, and they're like air filters okay um, and then they give out oxygen for us to breathe okay uh, what's the by the way what's the percentage of oxygen in our atmosphere anybody okay pay attention to the question again the percentage of oxygen in air what time is it i need to keep track of my time no it can't be 100% 100, 100 oxygen. Yes, I see some 24, 21. No, 90 is not there. Yeah, about zero. Oh. <laughs> uh, we're not living in space. <laughs> okay. All right, so it's about 21%. Okay, our air is composed of 21% of oxygen and about 78% is nitrogen. And the rest of 1% is about... Um, combination of other gases. Yes, it's really 20%, 21%. So, um, yeah, um, next slide, please. 
Okay, I'm not going to dwell much on the animalia. Okay, uh, what you can see is a tiger and a bird here. But what I would like to bring to attention is some microscopic forms like, um, have you heard about uh, tapeworms, roundworms, flatworms, nematodes, and flukes? Okay, now these are all, micro okay, Bog I see Bogdan's head going east to west. Okay, these are organisms that can be, they are literally worms, they are thread-like worms that cause diseases. They can cause uh, diarrhea, dysentery, it can cause, um, um, food poisoning, it can cause like, say for example, one tapeworm, there are two different types of tapeworms. One is tinea saginata. If you eat uh, beef, uncooked raw beef, you get this uh, a tapeworm called tinea saginata. And if you, they are like parasites, okay? And if you eat um, pork, okay, of course we don't eat that. Uh, if, you do, if you don't, if you eat uncooked or partially cooked pork, bacon or any of these, there's a, a parasite called tinea solium, okay, that can cause severe, uh, what to say, st stomach upset and disease. And roundworms can cause, um, yeah, a, a very uncomfortable uh, diarrhea as well. Um, what else? Helminths. I already said, talked about filaria. It's a nematode that causes elephantiasis. Have you heard about elephantiasis? It's like somebody's, um, <laughs> you get uh, elephant's leg. That's why it's called as elephantiasis, okay? All right, so yeah, these are some of the diseases that you can see in the, the warmer uh, countries, um, Africa, the Asian countries are some of the places that uh, you can see filariasis. Okay, moving on to the next slide, please. Okay. Sorry, just before you carry on, somebody said, would some worms cause cancer? Okay. No. I can't think about any worm that can cause cancer because um, cancer is typically caused by abnormal proliferation of cells. It means your cells keep dividing and dividing exponentially, okay? There is some trigger that causes the cells to divide. Okay, and there is some trigger that doesn't tell our system to stop producing those cells. Okay, in our, in our system, we have blood cells. They have white cells, red cells, and platelets. So all the white cells, the white cells are there to fight bacterial, uh, what to say, to fight against infections. Okay, uh, any, anything, the pathogen that comes into our body, our body reacts to that. So what happens is, in cancer, um, these white cells multiply. For a normal person, the white cell count has to be somewhere between four and 11. These numbers can be different in different countries, but in England and um, the UK, in the UK and Ireland, the normal range is around four to 11. So what happens in cancer is your white cell count can go up as high as 400 or even 700. Okay, that's only in blood cancer. Okay, and this is because of the abnormal, I told you about blast cells that are found in, uh, that can cause cancer. So these are the cells that don't mature our cells, the blast cell actually, matures into a platelet, matures into a red cell, and it matures into a white cell. Now, I can go into detail when I present the next honor, that is the blood and body's defenses. We can talk more about that. Okay, but to your question, if uh, worms cause cancer, no. Okay, right, I'm reminded that I have only 15 minutes. Okay, uh, but yeah, there are only two more questions to um, to finish, okay, let's go. So archaebacteria are something that are found in hot gases or in molten rock, okay? If you see in the picture there, you see some scientists there standing and dipping some slides in the hot water, hot boiling water. And to the surprise, uh, they have already learned that some unicellular organisms still live in such extreme temperatures, very hot, okay? The hot boiling water. So this life is, everywhere around us, from the depths of the ocean, okay, uh, all the way to the alpine mountains, you have life, abundance of life, God's amazing creation. Some are beneficial and some are not, okay? So let's say, we'll finish these kingdoms and then let's see what are the benefits and the disadvantages of uh, the microscopic life. Okay, next one, please.
you bacteria are like archaebacteria. They're complex, single-celled, okay, and they are found everywhere, okay. Um, and yeah, just like a little microscopic organisms, just like uh, archaebacteria. Um, uh, next one, please. They are used for making vitamins and because of their chemical makeup. Let's go to our next slide, please. Fungi or fungi, and some uh, how some fungi is, is how you pronounce. It is a multi multicellular, um, uh, and you know that yeast, penicillin, and ring ringworms all belong to this family. Uh, what you're seeing is a mushroom. Uh, this is. Uh, yeah, and it, it is a type of edible fungi. But in a microscopic life, what you would typically see are yeast, penicillin, and ringworms. All right, um, next one, please. All right, next one is, and the last one is the protists. Okay, these are slime molds and algae. And they are so different to each other. They include microscopic organisms that are not bacteria, they're not animals, not plants, and not fungi. Okay, and most protists are unicellular organisms. They have only one single cell. Um, yeah, uh, this is the, the smallest um, of all the six kingdoms are the protists. Okay, like protozoa, algae, a few examples. Okay, so. Now, coming to the uses of this microscopic life, okay? Uh, first one, this can be used in human food, like the living bread and cheese would not be possible without this microscopic fungi. And what about health? Um, microscopic life forms a very crucial role in human health. If you look into, I think we have done a digestion honor um, earlier on, somebody presented. Uh, there are a lot of bacteria that lines up uh, the gut, okay? Um, there's a very useful bacteria. Uh, they help in uh, breaking down of the food. They help in providing immunity, hemostasis, and protection against uh, pathogens. What happens is, if you take um, antibiotics, now antibiotics are, if you take unnecessarily, they can wash out all the gut flora. Okay, that's why they had to be prescribed and has to be taken in, yeah, not all the time. If you're sick, you don't pop in an antibiotic drug because what they do is they typically wash out all your gut flora and kind of makes you immunity go down. So, and your body is susceptible for infection. You will easily pick up an infection because uh, the, the lining of the stomachs is being destroyed by, uh, by, the, by the antibiotics. Okay, so what happens is, as I've mentioned here in my slide, dysregulation of gut flora leads to inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome are some of the things. Um, and some of the bacteria that causes infection are streptococcus, staphylococcus. Uh, streptococcus can cause throat infections, okay? Uh, staphylococcus can cause sepsis and wounds that you would see that. Salmonella and Listerichia coli can cause um, diarrhea, dysentery, and all that. Uh, yeah, next one, please. Now, coming to viruses, okay, you would have heard a lot about viruses. Okay, uh, please bear with me. You'll have to listen to me about this virus as well. Now, there are a few examples, okay, that I've listed down. Common flu, hepatitis, uh, mumps, measles, rubella, chickenpox, HIV, AIDS, okay? And all these can cause um, harm to you, right? Um, I mentioned earlier on common flu caused by influenza virus, hepatitis, Okay, uh, caused by hepatitis A, B, C, D viruses. Uh, mumps, rubella are all paromyxoviruses. Chickenpox is caused by varicella zoster, HIV, uh, human immunodeficiency virus. Okay, are a few of are some of the viruses. Okay, let's move on um, to parasites caused. Some of the parasites are malaria that can cause infection. Next one, please. Okay, I talked about penicillin. Some of the uses of microscopic uh, use is uh, penicillin, which is um, a common mold grown from a common mold, but it's a very powerful antibiotic, okay? Uh, it's used to treat bacterial infections. So by, by the way, uh, penicillin is not used for virus, so it's only used for bacterial infections. Okay, the other thing is vaccinations. So what happens in vaccination is you used a dead virus or a partially live virus, okay, that's injected into healthy people to develop an immunity against 
uh, a particular disease. Suppose if I'm taking a chicken pox uh, a virus, vaccination. Uh, a vaccination, for, sorry, if I'm taking a vaccination for chicken pox, so what I they do is I take an in injection where there is a live attenuated, oh, it's a big term, it's a live virus, okay, that can grow in your body and develop antibodies against the, the pathogen. So if there is a chicken, uh, so that you will not get a chicken pox because the antibodies fight against the pathogen. Similarly, the BCG, meningococcus, pneumococcal are a few of the vaccines that uh, are used to target the disease. Okay, but in this day and age now, we're yet to figure out uh, a viable or an effective vaccine for COVID-19. So hopefully in the next year or so, we will be able to get um, a vaccine for that. Trump has promised a vaccine before the elections. I don't think it's gonna happen. So what are the uses of, okay, again, uh, onto that. The last one is lichens. Now this lichens, you would have come across everywhere. If you've gone hiking, climbing mountains and trees. So they, they grow everywhere. The nice, bright and colorful uh, looking. Uh, they are a combination of a fusion of fungus and photosynthetic partner called the cyanobacteria. Um, they are plant-like, but not plants, all right? They come in di different colors and sizes and they grow everywhere. So what are the uses? It's just a microscopic life that, uh, can, that they can grow into different forms. Yeah, not much, basically. They grow on bark, they grow on trees, and also in extreme environments. Okay, next slide, please. All right, having learned about all the microscopic lives, there are some precautions that you need to take to, to take care of your body. Things like hand washing, tooth brushing. You know that if you don't wash your hands properly, I think by now all of us are used to hand washing. Um, at, at work, I wash my hands a million times. It's because of COVID-19 pandemic, right? It's very important that you wash your hands properly, good hand washing technique uh, to get rid of, uh, uh, to sanitize your hands, okay? I can't stress enough. Wash your hands before eating, after using a toilet. And if you go out of your home, if you go out and come back in, go straight to, to the washroom, wash your hands. Right, and you also need to do toothbrushing. That's important, hygiene, right? To get rid of uh, bugs or whatever, to prevent cavities and gum disease. These are some healthy habits. Uh, I think we have one or two more slides and then we're gonna come to an end. Um, Right, I've talked enough of uh, vaccines. Um, um, yeah, like you need to get like examples of polio and smallpox, smallpox both have been eradicated. Um, these are the good things that have come out of the microscopic life. Clean clothing, okay. Um, yes, uh, we all need to change our clothes every day, uh, especially um, your underwear and your socks. If you don't change them regularly, uh, if you use the same old, uh, bacteria and fungus can grow and you'll get an athlete's foot and you also get jock itch. It's very uncomfortable, I'm sure. Sorry, Seven, can I just go back to um, the vaccination? Somebody yeah. asked a question about if you uh, develop it or catch a virus, the vaccination is effectively a virus mm -hmm. being put into you. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. And so, I think they just wanted to ask how that process, you know, a little bit more about. Yes, okay, there are different ways of giving a vaccination. Some um, are live virus, some are half attenuated, in the sense like it is, the virus is there, but then it has been made, um, what to say, it's, uh, it, it has made incapable of causing disease. It's still live, but it can't cause the disease. So what it does is, once it's injected into your system, our body is amazing body, okay? We have these white cells. So they recognize this vaccine that's injected into your system, that it, it is a pathogen, it is an intruder. So it recognizes that and it produces antibodies. Say for example, chickenpox, right? Once you get chickenpox, you've got immunity for the rest of your life. Why? Because the antibodies that you have acquired through that vaccination are lifelong. And you wouldn't get that because anytime you get that, um, the varicella zoster virus, our body attacks that. But mind you, it can come back later and produce shingles, okay? That's one time, maybe as an adult or whatever, okay? But usually it affords immunity, okay? That is the way vaccines work. 
So that's what we're trying to work out for COVID-19. So we're trying to find out a vaccine that our body, once you've taken this vaccine, can remember this COVID-19 virus and it will attack every time that's in. So somebody said- Okay, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome, Natalie. Okay, so um, just a recap of all the things that we learned. We have learned uh, the different parts of a microscope. Um, we've learned about um, the different microscopes that can be used in different scenarios. We learned about how you could go about calculating the total magnification, multiplying the ocular lens versus the objective lens. And we have learned about the different microscopic lives around us. It's present everywhere, on your body, outside your home, water, streams, everywhere. Um, and we also learned about how they affect impact in life, disease, and in health. Okay. I've got a trivia question, right? Where in the Bible does it talk about um, the use of microscopic life? Before we go to the question time. Anybody? Where in the Bible does it talk about microscopic life? Anybody? Okay. Facebook is just a few seconds behind, so let's just see right, if they okay. come up so with anything. I'll wait for Facebook. In the meantime, maybe I should, maybe I can ask you to refer to words in the Bible. No? <laughs> just tell us. It is something to do with what you eat in the olden days. I think they're going to need a hint, aren't they? Matthew 13, 33. It's a festival. It's, uh, it is connected to a festival. Matthew 13. What 33. 33, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'm coming to it, okay? Uh, yes, I see a bread there, okay? Um, yeah, bread needs yeast. Um, for baking, uh, for baking bread, you can make unleavened bread, but you also make leavened bread. Okay. So during the Passover, the children of Israel were not allowed to make bread with yeast. Okay. What does that symbolize? It is okay. It is a symbol of sin. Okay. So you're not you're meant to make leavened bread. Um, so it's a time of reflection and repentance and the removal of sin from their lives. Okay. So. Yeah. So whoever who said yeast, you're right. So yeast is a microscopic life that grows and they can be cultivated for baking, the purposes of baking. And it was used since the time of the children of Israel. And Passover, especially, yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to take some questions. Uh, there are four minutes before we go on to the next one. So I can take a few questions if you have from anything. Someone's asked if leprosy is caused by bacteria. No, uh, leprosy is not caused by bacteria. Uh, it's caused by um, uh, Mycobacterium leprae. Yeah, bacteria. yeah it's, sorry, it's, it is a bacterium. Yeah, it's caused by Mycobacterium leprae. Yeah, it is because of leprosy. Yeah, you've seen that in. In biblical times, people who had leprosy, and they were asked to isolate themselves, sent out of the camp. Yeah. Um, there's another question. Uh, so, well, somebody's mentioned about um, viruses being trapped in the um, Arctic and Antarctic ice um, that's buried, you know, beneath the ice. Is that is that something that's real? Is there really viruses trapped beneath the permafrost there, in the ice? Yes. Yeah, there is uh, living organisms in the ice as well. Yeah, so there's forms of life everywhere. I Recently I've read an article on the BBC that there is um, uh, some kind of organisms that live in space as well. So we don't know what organism is that, but um, you have to find that out. But there are organisms everywhere, as I mentioned. They live in extremes of uh, temperatures and climates and environments. 